This lesson is going to be about three very simple expressions of the head. However, like most things that are simple, it's very difficult to understand the depth of how important it is and the impact that it makes on your ability to conceive of a three-dimensional portrait. We're going to be making three individual drawings, all right next to each other and all of the same model. We're going to proceed through the simplest possible expression of a subject, which in this case is going to be a rectangular cube. From there, we'll proceed to a softer but still geometrical shape that begins to resemble a lot more the organic nature of the forms of the head that we recognize. The third drawing is going to proceed on from there to express a little bit more the nuances of the actual head that we see. This exercise will be primarily form-based, but as any study of form, it's important to understand how light interacts with it. Most of the drawing will be done using three simple instruments. Of course, I've got my 2B pencil, my Prismacolor kneaded eraser, and a paper stump. The paper that I'm gonna be working on is a plain white Stonehenge, which I think is perfect for this exercise. We established a basic block that represented the proportions of a head, much like a sculptor would do, starting with a block of marble that was the size of their subject, into which they could cut to reveal the forms that are much more specifically related to that model. How we determined what perspective to draw that block in was by first identifying where are we looking at the model from? Are we on eye level with the model? Are we looking up at the model? Or are we looking down at the model? From the source image that we're using, I observed that the brow ridge going from the left-hand side to the right-hand side leading up to the three-quarter angle of the head, which aligns with the temporal line and the zygomatic bone, tilted downward. This indicated to me that we are looking down on the head so I should see a plane like this at the top of our block. Then in the second expression of our block, I shaved away various sections of the form to reveal a head-like template. I focused on a few critical features of the head to tell me where to shave those forms away. First, I connected together the idea of the turning edge of the zygomatic bone, the temporal line at the edge of the forehead, and the temporal line as it extends up the forehead and back to the back of the cranium. Then I looked for where the bottom of the ear met the back line of the jaw, which helped me figure out exactly where the mastoid process of the skull would be, which represents the bottom edge of the cranium. From there, I broke these two angles, going from the zygomatic bone on the left and on the right down to the widest point of the chin. In order to understand where that chin would be, I made a line that represented the vertical center line of the head. I then basically took exactly those proportions and angle breaks and transferred them here to my third drawing, which is where we're going to elaborate on those forms to make an actual portrait drawing. Now, as I work more on these shadow shapes, I want to bring back to your attention something I said at the beginning of the video. I wanted to work on this like a sculptor would work on a block of marble. Think about the tools that they're going to use for that, right? They're going to be using these enormous chisels and hammers banging away at the coarse surface of the stone. Only the roughest expressions of a subject are going to survive that kind of application. And that's what I want you to think about here. What is the biggest, roughest expression of this subject that you can come up with when you're working in this initial stage? As the hair represents a completely different kind of form, It's going to require a different kind of edge in between light and shadow. In fact, really to find the light and the shadow of the hair would be quite a messy thing. What I'm going to do here is try to indicate, to the best of my ability, the texture of the edge in between light and shadow, and also try to represent which parts of it are facing the light and which parts of it are facing away from the light. In this way, I'm going to be looking a lot more for what the form of the hair is versus what the local value of the hair is. So a local value is just what color is the surface of your subject. In the case of skin, it's rather light. It's not as light as the white of this paper, but it's rather light. The hair itself has a local value that is black. It's very, very dark. And so when that hair is in shadow, it's going to be incredibly dark. And when it's in light, it's going to also be relatively dark. In this case, I'm going to pretend that these two surfaces are relatively the same in terms of their local value. So I can represent a lot more easily their form, which is going to relate better to these two subjects here. If you think about it as well, this corresponds perfectly to our concept of working in marble. Marble, of course, being all relatively white. Every form in a marble sculpture, be it a passage of hair or the bark of a tree trunk or the portrait of a model, all are represented with the same local value. 
Now, while I'm doing this to this head, I also want to take this one. I want to start to turn the edge of this form. I want this to feel like a more rounded edge than say what this one does. Right now, the line quality is indicating that each of these edges is essentially the same kind of turn. I would like this one to be a little bit softer, a little bit more organic. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start hatching through that with my eraser and I'm gonna broaden my pencil the surface area that represents that boundary between shadow and light. Now I can also go through with my stump and smooth out some of the gradient of that edge. But I don't want you to think that the stump is the only thing I'm doing to soften that edge, to create that feeling of a turn. I'm also using my pencil to do that. Now let's take a look at these two different qualities of edge here. You can see that this one represents a turn in form, not dissimilar to this. Here, we've created a more of a transitional edge where we have a gradation leading to a darker central core shadow. This shows a softer turning of form, much more like the one that we find on our more organic head over here. Now to achieve that evenness of tone, it's a pretty simple technique I'm using. Notice how most of these hatch marks are in a diagonal pattern. Right now, I'm going over that diagonal pattern in a totally different direction. Now eventually, when I use my paper stump to even this out a little bit further, I'm also gonna go in a contrary direction. While these last hatch marks went vertical, I'm gonna go horizontal with my paper stump. Being careful in this area where the two sets of hatch marks have overlapped to go a little bit lighter so I don't reinforce an excessively dark section of value. If I continued on this trajectory from the most simple form to something slightly more organic, and now to something that more or less represents the model that I intend to draw, the underlying shapes that I'm making would not be any different to those that I would make if I were preparing this as a totally finished portrait drawing. Because this is made for the sake of teaching, I might elaborate and clarify those shapes just a little bit, but I want to express to you the power of this simplification. It's not just for studies. You can use it for totally finished artworks. It's a procedure that expands your vision and understanding of the subject, which is absolutely what's necessary if you intend to make a highly refined drawing. One of the things that I'm sure you're noticing, by the way, is the complete lack of a mouth on this bottom third of the face. If I'm totally honest, I'm gonna tell you that the mouth is essentially one of the most superficial forms of the head. What I'm more concerned with is the proportion of this area and also the overall roundness of the muzzle form itself. Once those things are established, drawing in the lips, though a little bit complicated, is more or less already solved. With that in mind, I'm gonna add in a couple of halftone planes. In order to indicate the volumes of the face that are kind of projecting out, or in the case of the muzzle form here, kind of dropping off from the light. You can also see that outer third of the forehead where we have a major plane drop off before we get to the temporal line and therefore the shadow plane of the head. Also important to mention here, the upper half of the eye socket in particular is totally a downward facing plane. And so I'm gonna add that same level of half tone in, especially to that upper half of the eye socket. We started out with this basic form, the most basic geometric expression we could possibly use to show what a human head more or less looks like, or even better, the space that it occupies in a 3D world. From that marble block, we moved on to a secondary form that is more representative of a human head in that the forms are slightly more rounded and organic. And also various passages of volume have been shaved away to create a templatized version of a human head. Then in the final stage, we've added a little bit more complexity to the shape of the major plane shifts of the head. We've added projections of form like the nose and eventually like the hair as well. And even delved just a little bit into the world of halftone to show how the light is progressing across the form before it truly turns into shadow. Each of these stages has something in it that we can use to better approximate the beginning stage of our drawing in relationship with the subject that we're working with. Initially, we were able to determine the basic proportions of the head from top to bottom and from side to side. After that, we started to elaborate on the basic form of the head and how light passes over those slightly more rounded forms. 
we also increased the amount of information in the drawing, which allowed us to search for different proportional markers and a slightly higher degree of specificity. In this final stage, we used everything that we prepared in the first two stages and stacked more good observation on top of it. Now, if this were to be something other than just an academic exercise or demonstration for students, all these different stages would take place inside the same drawing which represents the way that I would like you to think about accuracy. It is a progressive property in drawing. It is not a skill in itself. Meaning that this block, though it looks nothing like the subject, contains a certain degree or type of accuracy that can contribute to the accuracy of the final drawing. The same thing in this second stage. It looks only a little bit more like the subject, but there are a dozen markers in here that I use to contribute to the full expression of accuracy in the final drawing that I make. And then here in our final stage, without eyes or even a mouth, I've added tons more information, all of which I've measured, I've triangulated, and I've used to increase the degree of accuracy in the drawing overall. So just remember this, accuracy is the destination. Trust the stages that you go through in the process, work on increasing the amount of information and contributing to the accuracy at each stage so that eventually your detail rests on top of a really solid structure. That brings this video to a close. If you thought this lesson was pretty cool and you wanna check out like a way more in-depth version of it, you can follow the link in the description of this video and that will take you to my Patreon page where for just $10, you can get this lesson and tons of other really great portrait drawing and portrait painting tutorials, all made with a single goal in mind and that is to just make you a better portrait artist.